guitarist Slash. I was surprised even who I was, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Well, it's like two different sides of the fence, I admit, but when it comes down to it, it's just like he does what it was that I was doing, I did what he does, and so it really none of that book has anything to do with it. for the song it wasn't one of the songs i played on so i was a little bit reluctant to go up and sync to it so he let me play live on it which meant i could add my own whatever it is that i do to it you know the hysteria that's going on in south america about us coming over there is sort of apparently unequal you know like we've sold an amazing amount of tickets an amazingly fast amount of time compared to the acts that usually go over there. So we're just going to South America. I don't know if we're going to call back, to, <laughs> call back, you know, and say, you know, this is where we're at. I mean, because we're that's a whole different country altogether, and you just want to just go and focus on playing there. So um, we'll see how things develop. I don't, I don't know if if anybody in the states is going to hear from us for a while. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I think everybody's probably sick of us at this point, anyway. You know, so yeah, I'm glad to let us go away for a while. <laughs> so. Plan. The boys finally released those two new albums they've been talking about for the past several years. And in July, they were at the center of a good old-fashioned rock and roll riot here at the Riverport Amphitheater in St. Louis. Right now, for those who may have missed the band's various antics and accomplishments, here's a recap. <laughs> The band began the year at January's Rock in Rio Festival with two new members in tow, keyboardist and occasional conga man Dizzy Reed and former cult drummer Matt Sorum. And it ended up being the best thing that's ever happened to the band. You know, it made us a lot stronger as a group. You know, we got to be friends again in a different way because the tensions to make a new album have been so hard on us in L.A. You know, we're getting it done, but, you know, we really ended up needing this. It was kind of therapeutic. Then came promises of a tour, for which the guns warmed up with a blitz of one-night mini-dates that ripped through San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York City. The band's New York date also doubled as a video shoot for the Terminator 2 track, You Could Be Mine, which eventually arrived on MTV, tagged with an appearance by the Terminator himself. We filmed the show in the Ritz, and then, you know, I guess Arnold was flying back from Congress, I'm like, I want to be in the video. Finally, on Memorial Day weekend, Guns N' Roses launched their first ever headlining tour. I get up around seven, get out of bed around nine. Ever since we started, we've been aiming at, you know, being, we wanted our, our second major album, we wanted a headlining tour, you know, and to do it right. And it feels great. In a lousy season for concert tours, the Guns N' Roses show, with Skid Row opening up, prospered. And of course, there was never a dull moment. Every show, it seemed, featured an Axl Rose rant or two, and in St. Louis, after he jumped into the crowd to protect a fan or grab a camera or something, an actual riot ensued, resulting in 15 arrests, 80 injuries, a purported $200,000 worth of property damage, and the band's most heartfelt thanks in the notes to its next album. In the great tradition of Jerry Lee Lewis, the Rolling Stones, and Led Zeppelin, Trouble was Guns N' Roses' constant companion. They were fined by local officials in New York and Indiana and sued by their former drummer, Stephen Adler, who charged that they'd encouraged his incapacitating heroin addiction. But the band roared on, bringing its world-beating sound to Europe in August, and at every stop along the way, insisting that its long-delayed brace of Use Your Illusion albums would be coming out real, real soon. I just want to get it as soon as possible. It's thought-provoking, violent, and negative. Finally, on September 17th, one and a half million fans across the country lined up at record stores to actually buy Use Your Illusion 1 and or 2. So what really took so long? Success, you know, made it take a long time. That, that sudden realization of like being huge. And then there was the associated drug problems that, that you know, ensued. With a new strictly sales-driven ranking system recently instituted, Guns N' Roses became the first band to debut at number one and two on the Billboard chart. Don't you cry tonight. 
Ironically, the first single released after the two albums finally appeared was a song that dated all the way back to the band's scuffling club days, although the video that accompanied it was very much a product of the group's rock star present. Very self-indulgent, extremely self-indulgent. Hey, so self-indulgent, I'm going to film three versions of myself tonight. Then, on Thanksgiving, Axl Rose announced to the world that Guns guitarist, songwriter, and singer Izzy Stradlin had resigned from the band and was being replaced by one Gilby Clark from an L.A. group called Kill for Thrills. Exactly what this crucial personnel change might mean for rock's most charismatic band remains to be seen. Detroit this weekend because of an unusual injury to Axl Rose. It happened during Tuesday night's show at the Nutter Center in Dayton, Ohio. Guns N' Roses was four songs into its set performing the tune It's So Easy when a weld on Axl's microphone stand broke. The metal piece cut a deep slice across the palm of his right hand. In this footage given to us by the band, the actual accident occurs while Axel is off camera, but you will see him keep singing and duck off stage to wrap his hand in a towel without interrupting the song. Though bleeding profusely, Axel insisted on finishing the show before getting medical attention. The gash was stitched up by a local doctor. Rose plays pianos on the piano on the Use Your Illusion song, November Rain, and he feared serious long-term nerve damage that could keep him from playing piano, among other activities. So on Wednesday, he flew to New York City to see a specialist for surgery. While Slash accepting the Favorite Metal Artist Award seemed all too aware of his obscenity-laden speech two years ago. I'll try and do it cool this time. I want to thank the American Music Awards, <laughs> all the Guns N' Roses fans, fans who supported us and been behind us for the last seven years. Remember this is the day in rock. Guns N' Roses keyboard player Dizzy Reed was served with a paternity suit in Los Angeles on Tuesday morning by a 24-year-old woman named Angela Parker, who claims that Reed is the father of her 16-month-old daughter, Morgan Alexandria. Parker works as a secretary and in her suit is seeking sole custody of the child and $5,000 a month in child support. At a press conference in Los Angeles, she produced a copy of her daughter's birth certificate, which identified Reed, whose given name is apparently Darren A. Reed, as the father. She also said that she had begun a relationship with Reed immediately after meeting him in a Los Angeles nightclub and was six months pregnant when he left to go out on tour with a pre-Guns N' Roses band in July of 1990. Parker says she later discovered that three months before she gave birth, Reed had married another woman and that while Reed had initially sent her a series of five checks for $250 each, he subsequently broke off contact with her and stopped his financial support. After I had the baby, he came to see her. He brought, he brought her some... Christmas gifts, uh, a few things, and he bought a di the normal things that babies need, like diapers and formula and stuff like that. He gave me, uh, he gave me uh, some money um, from when was it? He gave me money starting in October, uh, excuse me, April of 1991 through September of 1991, and then nothing else. The paternity of Parker's daughter has not yet been established through blood tests, and no comment on the suit has yet been made by Guns N' Roses management. In drinking news, Black Death Vodka, the Belgian liquor that recently signed Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash as its celebrity spokesman and immediately incurred the wrath of the U.S. Surgeon General Antonio Novello, was ordered this week to change its logo, its motto, and its packaging or else be banned from the U.S. market. The Federal Bureau Hall Tobacco and Firearms had approved the Skull and Top Hat Black Death label in 1989, but suddenly decided that the logo resembled the symbol for poison and so might confuse consumers. Black Death representatives called this a witch hunt, and by week's end, the government had backed off a bit, delaying any final decision on the vodka's fate until mid-June. Well, Guns N' Roses abruptly canceled a concert in Chicago on Friday night and also called off two shows outside of Detroit this week when it seemed likely that local police in both areas, acting on behalf of authorities in St. Louis, would arrest lead singer Axl Rose on an outstanding bench warrant. Rose was charged with four counts of misdemeanor battery and one count of property damage last year. A Guns N' Roses concert at St. Louis's Riverfront Stadium.
is eventually convicted on all those charges, Rose could face up to four and a half years in jail. However, the St. Louis County Prosecutor's Office never set an actual court date for Rose to answer to those charges and says it was assured that Rose would return to the city at his earliest convenience. The Guns N' Roses representative says Rose learned half an hour before Friday's Chicago show that county sheriffs were planning to arrest Rose and extradite him to St. Louis, so he decided to flee a victim of what the representative calls celebrity persecution. Rose reportedly has offered to play a charity concert in St. Louis, but that hasn't stopped local prosecutor Robert McCulloch from seeking his arrest. The difference between him and any other fugitive is that because of his public schedule, we know where he's going to be and when he's going to be there. The decision that it was Last time. week, uh, there was time. He was back in the general area, and he's had eight months to do it. Uh, the, the intake center is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It would have taken him two or three hours to get through the process, and uh, he's had eight months to do that on his own. Guns N' Roses' canceled Chicago concert will not be rescheduled, and it's not certain how the outstanding warrant against Axl Rose will affect the band's scheduled appearance at the Freddie Mercury Tribute concert in London on April 20th. After, uh, when when we stayed in, and right now we're back backstage at Wembley in one of the dressing rooms with uh, another headliner here, Slash of Guns N' Roses. You guys have been uh, uh, tried a couple of years ago to do uh, play a benefit for the gay men's health crisis, and now you're here at this AIDS benefit. Is this like an issue for you guys? Well, it's. It's, well, it's an issue for me. It really cramps my style. The whole AIDS thing is really not, I'm not, it's not clicking with me, you know. But, um, uh, we, you know, things come up and we're like, well, yeah, we'd like to get involved and try and do something to help it out. But then it turns around on us, right? Yeah. And they got, like, all these gay activist groups and jumped on our, our case yeah. for being involved with this to the point where there was a question as to whether or not it was even safe for us to do this gig. And finally, we just said, screw it, let's just do it, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, whatever. I hope, you know, we don't get shot or anything. Well, it's but it's, yeah, it's like, I don't know what, what they're so uptight about. Yeah. You know, they were saying they were going to do whatever they could to sabotage the sh our part of the show. And they, they had totally attacked the whole Queen organization for allowing us on the bill and all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> it, it's never ending, you know, yeah. it's always something. It's like so ridiculous. This is all hangover from one in a million, I suppose, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you were, I gather you were probably a Queen fan. No? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the bands that I was definitely leaned on. Yeah. And I, at, at rehearsal um, for this thing the other day, uh, it was great. I mean, I was like a little kid. We got up, got up and played uh, Tie Your Mother Down with, with Brian May. Wow. You know, and we're standing, I'm like standing next to, well, it's weird when you're coming up, you don't see yourself ever doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you get hooked up like the stones, and then it's the so-and-so, and you're like, wow, you know. You start <laughs> recording with all these people that you knew about yeah. when you were a little kid, and they just seem so distant. So, I'm going to play it tonight. Yeah. yeah. It must be great to stand next to Brian. Oh, now. yeah, and he's, a, he's like one of the, the sweetest guys, you know, really easy to get along with, and really gracious, you know, as far as there's, there's no pop star attitude yeah. or and no air is going around. It's cool. This whole gig is going to be really cool. We're going to look forward to seeing you out there. Yeah. We're going to, uh, to finish things off here. We're about done with our pre-show. However, the uh, two-hour highlight show is coming up in just a couple of minutes on the Fox Network, so do tune over to that. We'll have a complete wrap-up on the uh, Day in Rock on Tuesday, and MTV will be airing the complete concert next Saturday starting at noon, so try to catch that too. We'll see you For then. Dave Dorr. Now, Dizzy Reed, the keyboard player, he, uh, he blew it. You see, there was this big encore at the end. It was the last finale number, We Are the Champions, where everybody got on stage to sing, We Are the Champions. But Dizzy wasn't there. I mean, Billy Squire and the Scorpions got on stage, and they weren't even part of the show. How'd you get on there, dude? They have probably have good managers with a lot of money. I don't know, but Dizzy wasn't there. Why wasn't he there? I followed him back to his hotel with a friend at large camera, and this is what he told me. They wouldn't let me on because I didn't have my pass. <laughs> but I was there in spirit. Guns N' Roses is going to Europe. They're going to be there in a couple of weeks doing this big tour with Soundgarden and Faith No More. It's going to be major. Sorry, Paul. Anyway, then they're coming back to the States for a rumored stadium tour with Megal. <laughs> The whole vibe around the whole place, uh, for the amount of bands that are here, is really, really cool. Everybody's sort of like let down the whole 
I don't know, the celebrity status kind of attitude and just been really cool. Long-time AIDS activist Elizabeth Taylor. Well, you know what was funny was I didn't know you know she was here. I go into the green room, right? I take my clothes off and stuff, and I turn around and there she is, all sparkles and stuff. I'm like, hi. You know? <laughs>